Hello and welcome to Diving Deeper, Year 2, the New Testament. This is the first week. We're going to start out today and go for the next year as we're going to look at the New Testament. You're going to have the chance to read it twice if you follow along. And we're going to find out who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So let's pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And if you're wondering about my attire, it's not my habit to wear this, but we just had St. Francis Day, and St. Francis was out blessing animals, and now St. Francis is teaching the New Testament. Well, before we start, I want you to know that questions are always welcome, and I urge you to write them down during the week as you're doing your reading so that you won't forget them. Uh, and for those of you who are watching us online, if you will email us, uh, Tom Rutherford at churchofthemessiah.com. Uh, email your questions and we'll answer them here on camera. Uh, I'm always going to ask at the beginning and end of the group any questions from your reading or previous weeks or observations. Uh, no, we don't have any previous weeks at this point, but any questions you have about the New Testament or the Bible, and, and we're going to, and if we'll answer your questions sometime soon in the course of what we're going to talk about anyway, I'll put you off to that. But if it's not something we're going to talk about soon, we'll, we'll take care of that. So, any questions so far? Not about the New Testament. Though. Not about the New Testament. Well, you got to wait three years till we get back to the Old Testament. <laughs> well, we're looking at why does the Bible exist? Well, what's the first verse of the Bible? In the beginning. In the beginning what? The heavens and the earth. Ah, got it. nope. That's the first verse in the Bible. That's not the first verse of the Bible. Oh, really? The first verse the of the Bible is John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Well, what's a word? What does the word word mean? It communicates. Something that communicates, something that expresses meaning. Exactly. And so the word of, and the beginning was the Word of God, the expression of God, everything that God has done from the beginning has been to express himself, to communicate who he is and how much he loves us and to reveal himself to us. So the word of God, the expression of God is anything that reveals God. And the Bible is a big part of that. The Bible is a seamless whole. H W H O L E, not H O L E. The Bible is a seamless whole. Yes, there's a new an Old Testament and a New Testament, but they go together. And everything in the Old Testament points ahead to Jesus and everything in the New Testament is about Jesus, and all of it reveals God. So in that same chapter, John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That Jesus is the perfect expression and representation and revelation and the image of God. Now, all of us are created in the image of God. But Jesus is certainly the most faithful and accurate image of God. So the purpose of the Bible, the purpose of the Word, the purpose of the Bible is to be a Word of God, not the Word of God. Now the Bible is a Word of God in that it is one of the ways that God reveals Himself. It's not the Word of God in that it's not the only way that God reveals Himself. God reveals Himself through history, through creation, through the Scriptures, primarily and most accurately in Jesus. He reveals himself to us in the church, through sacraments, through people, through literature, through movies, through just about any place you're looking, God can reveal himself and show himself to, to us. If you look at anything close enough, you're gonna find Jesus in there somewhere. That those words of God exist all over the place. But Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, the incarnation that God became a human being to reveal himself to us. We're still looking at why the Bible exists. John chapter 20, verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The purpose of the Bible is so that we can know Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus, then we get to know God the Father. Uh, Jesus was talking at the Last Supper, and Philip says, oh, you know, if you just show us the Father, 
And Jesus says, how can you say that? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only do and say what I see and hear the Father saying and doing, that Jesus did only what his Father did. So the purpose of the Bible is so that we can know Jesus, to believe he loves us, and to have eternal life with him, because as we know Jesus, then we get to know the Father. Jesus shows us the Father. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the Bible is not God-dictated. God didn't have somebody sit down and God says, Take a letter, Paul. Now, Paul did dictate his letters yeah. to other scribes, but God did not dictate the Bible. God breathed it into human beings, and then expre God expressed himself through those human beings' personalities. And so, if you said, told me something about God, and you told me something about God, and you told me something about God, you could tell me the same thing, but you would tell me in different words, in different ways, because it would be filtered through your personality. And just because it was filtered through human personalities doesn't mean it's less accurate. It just means that's one of the facets that God shows us of himself. So as we read about God all through the Old and the New Testaments, there's lots of stuff about God, and lots of it's very, very similar. Some of it's very different. But it's not because God's different. It's because different people saw it. Different people preserved, per, perceived it. Different people expressed it. So the scripture is here, uh, the scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, breathed into each, each of the authors to write about their experience of God and to express it through their personality. Now the problem with having experience with God is, and people do this over and over again, is they think, I have this experience of God, and that's the way that God is. And if you don't have the same kind of experience, then you must not have experienced God. And that's simply not accurate. Now, if you come from a more evangelical Protestant end of the church, they will ask you, are you saved? And you can say, well, yeah. They'll say, well, when were you saved? And what they mean by that is when was the minute in your life that you made a conscious decision to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and to follow him as your Lord? Okay, A lot of people have an experience like that. Paul did on the road to Damascus. But there's an, also a number of people, often in sacramental kinds of churches, liturgical churches like ours, that will tell you, well, I've gone to church all my life. I've always known that God loved me. I've always felt like I've had this relationship with God. I've always tried to do what I thought God wanted me to do. So, I don't know. Well, if that's your experience of God, then you can say, when were you saved? Well, on the first Good Friday, about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, because that's, that's, as far as we know, that's about when Jesus died. So that's when I was saved. And both answers are entirely correct. And if somebody insists that you have this dateable conversion experience, they don't know their scriptures as well as they think they do. That may be their experience, but if they're insisting upon your having that experience, then that's inappropriate. That's their expressing the word of God inaccurately. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, if you come to a liturgical church over and over again, you're going to say in the liturgy, Jesus is Lord. You're going to say it over and over again. So you got half, you're halfway there. So if you ever come to believe that God raised him from the dead, you're in. When was that the first time? I don't know. Age two, three, four, 16, 20. I, I don't know. You may not know. But people tend to insist that you need to have the same experience that I do or your experience isn't valid. And that's simply untrue. And one of the benefits of being in a liturgical church like ours is that we'll give you a wide range of ways to experience God and to accept Jesus and to have a relationship with him. And we understand that all of those are words. All of those are ways that you encounter God. And in liturgical sacramental churches, we build it into our buildings. The art and the architecture, the shape of the building, the, the words of the liturgy, 
the actions that we do, whether it's this or this or dipping your finger in water, all of those ways are, are ways to experience God and encounter Him and, and deepen your relationship with Him and, and taking communion and getting baptized and getting anointed with oil and getting married. All of those ways are ways that we experience God. And we understand in sacramental churches, every one of those is a word of God. And we do them not because they're in the book, we do them so that you can have an experience of God. Now, does everybody like all the same stuff? No. Does everybody experience God the same way? No. But once again, in a liturgical church, by the time we do the liturgical year and the time we do the lectionary over the three or the six year cycle, and we do all the stuff that we do, somewhere in there, you're gonna bump into God. And we try to build every Sunday. So somewhere every Sunday, you're going to bump into, somewhere Sunday, you're going to get to do something you like, something that touches you, something that brings you closer to God. Now, we hope you put up politely with the other stuff. But the reality is, and, and this, this is what I know, when, when we sing a hymn, and at the end of the hymn, you hear this. I, I mark in my hymnal, we're not ever going to do that one again at Messiah. <laughs> But the fact that it's in the hymnal means it's somebody's favorite. Somebody picked that hymn. Somebody lobbied for that hymn to be in the hymnal. That's somebody's favorite. And I recognize that, but I also recognize that in our culture and in our congregation, there's just some hymns that don't work. And so what I try to do is pick the ones that I know are meaningful to you. And if you got some other favorites, tell me and we'll put them in the stack until I hear somebody do that with them. Yes, exactly. So all scripture is God breathed, useful for teaching, useful for rebuking, correcting, and training. All words of God are like that, are God breathed. And the scriptures are a particular word of God, but all those different ways that we get to know God. And the scriptures are useful to teach, to rebuke, to correct, to train in righteousness. Now, the Bible's not a rule book, but it is God's guidelines to equip us for every good work. The Bible gives us insight how best to get along with God and how best to get along with people. And you think the Ten Commandments, you know, if you want to get along with people, it's probably pretty good not to murder people, commit <laughs> adultery with them, steal their stuff, lie to them, lie about them, or covet their stuff. That's probably pretty good rules, to uh, guidelines to get along with people. And if you want to get along with God, don't have any other gods, don't make idols. Don't use his name in vain. All of that makes sense. All of that makes sense. So the Bible, yes, there are some rules in it, but it's not primarily a rule book. It's guideline. How do you get along with God and people? And the word is there to communicate who God is to us and how God operates and how much he loves us and then how to respond to that. Other, other things that the Bible has reasons that the Bible exists. Psalm 119, which we read last year in the Old Testament. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It is the Bible's commentary on itself. And Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? God's guidelines shall tell us how to keep pure, how to live in such a way to have peace. Peace inside ourselves, peace with other people, peace in our family, peace with our neighbors, peace with God. And now, purity is not one of those real sexy sorts of things that say, what do you want to be in your life? I want to be pure. Eh, probably not. <laughs> but the reality is the older you get, the purer you probably want to be, even if you don't necessarily express it that way. Because as we get older, what we discover is the more we allow to pollute our lives or contaminate our lives with selfishness and immorality and that sort of stuff. As fun as it sounds when you, before you do it, uh, it usually ends up not being that way or not being that way for long. Joshua chapter one, verse eight, God says to Joshua, keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Who doesn't want to be successful? Who doesn't want to be prosperous? 
You go to any bookstore, you go to any online, any online site, you say, uh, how do I get prosperous? How do I win? How am I successful? Uh, you go get a master's of business administration to tell you how to be successful, right? You spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy to do that. And lots of people do that. And God says it right here. Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Chew on it. Think about it. Because as you allow the scriptures to form your attitudes and to form the ways that you think and the ways that you express yourself and the ways you interact with other people, what you find is you tend to get along with people better. And in your MBA, did they tell you, make friends with people? Contacts, right? Make friends with people, relationships with people. People don't want to do business with you if they don't trust you. Uh, they're more likely to do business with you if you have a relationship, especially if they trust you. If they've seen how you act, if you treat them the way you want, that they want to be treated, if you treat them the way you want to be treated, your tend to, business tends to go smoother that way. I mean, we all know people who are jerks. Uh, and they succeed in business because they either have some good or some service that nobody else has, or they've got somebody over the barrel, or they've got something on somebody, or they pay bribes, or they do whatever they do. But to allow the scriptures to form how we think and how we speak and how we interact and to form our attitudes very likely will help us tend to be more prosperous and more successful. It, it works. Uh, and if you want if, if what you want and what the Bible say, if what you want and what the Bible say conflict, do what the Bible says. Do what the Bible says. Because all of us want what we want when we want it. All of us are selfish. We all are. And all of us, minds are clouded by what we want. All of us are blind to aspects of our personality that we don't realize annoy other people. I want you to think about whoever that person is that annoys you the most, okay? Whoever that person is, you are that person to somebody. You don't mean to be, you don't want to be, but you annoy some people. And you don't even know you do it. Churches are a week for the same reason, too. Something Sometimes. You probably see in them. Sometimes. Yeah, often it's, you don't like stuff in other people because you know what's in you, yeah. often. But... The reality, the, coming back to this, allowing the scriptures to change me rather than my making the scriptures fit what I think needs to happen. Okay, so that's why the scriptures exist, to show us God so that we get to know him through Jesus, to help us guide our lives so that we have peace, so that we get along with God, so we get along with other people. And so we have some idea of how to live prosperously and successfully. God wants you to win. Now, He wants you holy. He wants you to be in relationship with Him. That's, um, yeah, He wants you to be happy, but that's th third or fourth down His list. What He really wants is for you to be in relationship with Him. That's, that's His top priority. And His second priority is that you would be in right relationship with human beings. With those, those are right up there at the top. Uh, happy, prosperous, successful. Yeah, he wants that, but that's, that's further down the list. And the way that you get down here is by doing what's up here. That we allow God's priorities to be our priorities. Okay, so in the New Testament, where are we going this year? Well, if you follow the preparations for next week, each week, then what's going to happen is you will read the New Testament twice. Now, over the course of last year, we read the Old Testament once because the Old Testament is twice as long as the New Testament. So if the Old Testament, if the New Testament is only half as long as the Old Testament and you read the same amount, you'll read it twice. It won't hurt you. Okay. Uh, I, in my Bible, to keep up with what the assignments say every week, you're going to be reading approximately 10 pages a week. Sounds pretty oppressive, doesn't it? That sounds, say what? pages 10 pages a week two pages a day now that's even giving you saturdays off saturdays and sundays off two pages a day so uh if you miss a couple of days you know it's okay you could probably catch up 
So 10, 10 pages a week, that's approximately what it'll be, and you'll get it. Okay, the topics we're going to cover, and you've got the list of that, and if you are online and you did not, if you don't get the emails that tell you what we're doing each week and give you the handout for each week, if you will email the office here at Church of the Messiah, office at churchofthemessiah.com, and you ask for them, we'll put you on the email list, and you'll get these every week. So what we're going to cover... Well, today's the introduction. Why, why the Bible? Okay, and we're going to talk about that too. Um, I skipped over something. Sorry, shame on me. How the Bible is arranged. Uh, you've got on the back of your handout, and once again, if you ask us, we'll email you this. You've got how the Bible is arranged. If you were here last year, you remember this. Oh yeah, I saw that. That the Old Testament, which was arranged by Jewish people, has three sections. It has the Torah, the law, the history, which is Genesis through Esther. And then it's got literature, which is Job through Song of Solomon. And then it's got prophets, which is Isaiah through Malachi. That each of those sections of the Old Testament is a particular kind of literature. The Torah, the law, the history are is historical. It's kind of just tells you the story of what's going on and who did what to whom and when they did it and all that sort of stuff. The literature Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, is all poetry. It's relational with God. It's love songs to God. It's praise songs to God. It's Proverbs is pithy sayings that are wisdom. Ecclesiastes is Solomon's observations after a long life, uh, after a long and wasted life. And Song of Solomon is a celebration of love and marriage. The prophets are messages from God to his people. Some of them are, um, all of them are written by the people whose names they have. So Isaiah wrote Isaiah, Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah. Lamentations is also by Jeremiah. There's not a guy named Lamentations, but Jeremiah wrote that. Ezekiel, Daniel, and so on like that. So the Old Testament has these three sections. Well, the New Testament was written by Jews, people, Jewish people. Everybody that wrote in the New Testament except for Luke was a Jew. And Jew was a follow, a Gentile follower of Paul. But everybody else was Jewish. So it makes sense that the New Testament is arranged the same way as the Old Testament. That you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Those historical books you got first. And then you've got the writings. You've got literature, which would be those letters from Paul. Letters from these other guys. That would be Romans through Jude. And then you've got one book of prophecy, Revelation. Now, Revelation is at the end of the Bible. It's the last one we're going to read, and there's a reason for that. Because people often try to say, I'm going to read Revelation because it sounds so cool. And then they read Revelation, and they're like, oh, my God, what does this mean? And they don't understand it. And then they have some Jehovah's Witnesses knock on their door, or they have somebody else knock on their door that explains it all to them, and they're like, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? Or they have the Mormons show up, and they don't know what to do. So we're leaving Revelation to last because it's good to know this other stuff first, and that will help you understand Revelation. It's not that Revelation is not important, but Revelation, it's wise to leave it to the last, just like we left the prophets to the last in the Old Testament. So it's no surprise that the New Testament is arranged the same way as the Old Testament. Those three sections in the same order, and there's some, there's some parallels there. Any questions about how the Bible is arranged? Okay, now we're looking at topics we're going to cover. We're in the introduction today, why the Bible. Uh, next week, we're going to recap the Messianic prophecies. Uh, we did this in the Old Testament um, a month or more ago, but we're going to relook at the Messianic prophecies to say, okay, if the Messiah is coming, what should we look for? How will we recognize him or her when he or she shows up? If somebody just announces, I'm the Messiah, are they? No. <laughs> no. A number of people have announced they're the Messiah, including some who are alive now. There are people today who say, yep, I'm the Messiah. I'm the second coming of Jesus. Sun Young Moon said that. Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith didn't really say that, but he kind of intimated that. Muhammad didn't say that, but 
Muhammad kind of took that place. So we're going to look at what the Old Testament says. This is who to look for. So that we can check and see, okay, does this guy that we say is the Messiah, does he, does he fit? Does he fit the mold? Does he? Well, we're going to look at that and see. Okay. We're going to look at Jesus' birth and the stuff that surrounded that and what difference that made and his early life. Now, we don't really have a whole lot about Jesus as a child. There's some people that really confuses and bothers. But apparently, the folks who wrote the New Testament didn't think that was very important. So they left it out. And what we have in the New Testament, John says, I'm not writing everything that Jesus did, because if we did, there wouldn't be room in the whole world for all the books that would be written. So each of them recognizes they had a finite amount of time and a finite amount of space and a finite amount of, of people's attention span to write. And so they put in what was most important. Okay. Those of us that preach, you have to, we, we want you to come back week after week. Because there's no one sermon that says everything you need to know. There's no one sermon that tells you everything I know. <laughs> but over the course of time, one hopes over the course of my career that I will share everything that I know and share, I hope, everything you need to know. But even then, there's more. There's so much more. Uh, you can go to our library and there's stacks and stacks and shelves and shelves of books and you could read them all and you still wouldn't know everything. So the Bible tells us the most important stuff and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the temptation and the prayer life of Jesus to help us resist temptation and pray well. That if you want to talk and listen to God, Jesus gives us some examples. He, he gives us some guidelines and some ways that will help us to be able to pray and listen to God better. We're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount and how that shapes the rest of what Jesus said and did. And was the Sermon on the Mount, was it something he gave one time? Was it something he did? He said as he went from town to town? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, but we're going to look at it because uh, it does shape, uh, I mean, it does set some direction for Jesus, and it lets us know, um, the, it, it, it sheds light on the rest of what Jesus said and did. We're going to look at parables. Parables are stories with a twist. They start going out in one direction, and they end up someplace else. The word parable comes from the word parabola, which is from geometry. And a parabola is a function that on a chart goes and does a line. Sometimes it does that, sometimes it does that, sometimes it does that. But it's, it start, it's a line that is, is graphed in one way, and then it ends up twisting and going in a different direction. And Jesus' parables do that. You start listening to one, and, and then he goes, what? They, don't, they often don't end the way you think that they might. We're going to look at a bunch of the parables. We're going to look at his miracles, what he did, why he did them, what they mean, and to ask the question, does he still do that kind of stuff? And I think he does. We're going to spend a week on Holy Week. We're going to spend a Sunday, uh, a time together on Holy Week because of what happened in that last week of Jesus's life is once again, he knows he's going to die. He knows this, this, is, this is his last chance to speak to the crowd and to his disciples. So he's cramming in. He wants to make sure everybody hears what, what's going on. And we want to say, okay, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, you know, what did those mean? What did those do for us? We're going to look at um, the book of Acts and how Jesus' friends responded or didn't. And it's really encouraging that they're such stooges because that means that, you know, if God can work through them and use them, there's a chance for me. Because when we look at those 12 stooges, and, and they are, um, you know, I don't look so bad. We're going to look at Pentecost and what the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does and how the Holy Spirit came out and what happened on that day of Pentecost and, and what that means both 
from the past and the present when it happened and the future for today. We're going to look at the church in Jerusalem and how it set itself up. Because as soon as you get more than about 10 or 15 people, suddenly you've, you've got to have some kind of structure or people start arguing and bumping heads and disagreeing and there's conflict with each other. And there was that in the church in Jerusalem, especially as it got larger and larger and larger. And so um, we're going to look at how the early church structured itself to serve itself and to spread the message of Jesus. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on church government. We'll do that next year when we look at the church. We're going to look at Paul and who he was, Saul of Tarsus, as he becomes Paul, how he's converted and what that changes about him and how he traveled around and what he did and how he got thrown in jail over and over again and how he got beat up everywhere he went and how he was misunderstood and what that resulted in, which are all of those letters that he wrote, that Paul wrote a big, huge chunk of the New Testament. And Paul becomes the most important person after Jesus in the life and our understanding of who God is. So we're going to look at Romans. We're going to spend several weeks on Romans because Romans is his longest work, but it's also the one that's, that really organizes his, his understanding of who Jesus is and how it is we relate to Jesus and what Jesus does inside of us and how it is that we should respond to Jesus and how it is we should live with each other. That Romans does all of that. And so we're going to spend three weeks looking at that. Then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians because the church in Corinth had problems. Lots of them. Now you may be shocked to hear that a local church might have problems. <laughs> that, that may come as a surprise to you. But anytime you get people, you're going to have problems. And the church in Corinth had lots of them. And the great news is Paul has this list of problems that he just goes down his list and he deals with them one at a time and you can follow it. And, and in your own church, you can go, yep, we did that. And yeah, we did that one. And uh, hey, we hadn't done that one. Good for us. We're better than those guys. And then because, because they didn't get it the first time, he writes them a second letter. So we're going to look at all of that, uh, which will include looking at communion what Jesus did and said and meant when he instituted it and how Paul interpreted that, which is then how it comes down to us today. And just a little teaser here, if you've ever been, if you're not Roman Catholic and you've ever been to a Roman Catholic church and they told you you couldn't have communion, I'm going to tell you why. It's not because they're being snobs. They're being what they interpret being as being scriptural. They're following part of the Bible and it's in 1 Corinthians and we'll get there. We're going to look at gifts of the Spirit and how it is that God works through us both supernaturally and through our personalities and through our natural giftings and talents. That God works through each of us and gives each of us gifts and talents. We're going to look at that and how that works. We're going to look at the resurrection, not Jesus' resurrection, but our own. And what it is that we have to look forward to and why it is that we don't need to be afraid of death. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians where he deals with some more problems of how God partners with us to change the world. We're going to talk about giving and that means your time and your talent and your treasure and how it is that you manage all of your stuff uh, and how it is that it all belongs to God, not just some of it. We're going to look at faith versus works. That, okay, um, how, do you, how is it that you make sure God loves you? Well, he already loves you. There's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. Nothing you can do to make God love you any less. So Galatians concentrates on that. Did, you know, did God do, come to you and do miracles among you because you followed the law, because you followed the rules, because you did all the right stuff, or because you believed? Uh, I just kind of gave it away about where Paul ends up on that. We're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit and how to grow it, about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and how it is that God wants to grow that inside of us, and how it is we can cooperate to let him do that. We're going to look at Ephesians and salvation by grace through faith, and we're going to look at marriage and family and what God has to say 
about the marriage relationship and about families, and that would include sexuality and sexual identity and all of that sort of stuff. And we're going to look and see what the scriptures have to say about that. We're going to recognize that we have an enemy. Uh, if you came to church today, you heard about that. But we have an enemy, and Ephesians talks about spiritual warfare and how to fight in the spiritual realm against not flesh and blood, but against demons and powers of darkness. Uh, we're going to look at joy and peace, how to, how to not be anxious. How would that be? To live anxiety-free, to live with peace in your heart, peace in your mind peace in your body. Imagine that and how healthy that could be. We're going to look at how Jesus is God, and Paul expresses that in Colossians. We're going to talk about Jesus coming back and what he had to say. And I'll just let you know, I'm not going to give you a timeline. I'm not going to give you the date of when he's showing up. Jesus is pretty clear about that. Nobody knows. But in First and Second Thessalonians, Paul tells us a lot of what's going to happen when he does come back. And we are going to look at that. We're going to look at leadership. First and second Timothy and Titus is Paul writing to Christian leaders. And how is it that, and whether or not you're a leader in your congregation, you've got leaders in your congregation. And this is what to look for as you raise those leaders up, as you choose those leaders and what to pray for. Because you get the leaders you pray for. And if you got stinky leadership and you're not praying for them it's on that's partially on you so pray for your leaders because what they do and what they say influences and benefits or <laughs> denigrates you we're going to look at hebrews which is a long book to a, a jewish book talking about how jesus is our high priest and what he does for us, what he's done for us, and what he does for us, and all of that stuff that we looked at in the Old Testament about sacrifices and animals and all of that, that'll pay off. You're gonna go, oh yeah, I remember that. That's what that means. We're gonna look at faith and what it is and what it does. And then the opposite of Galatians that talks about faith versus work, in James, we're gonna look at works versus faith that Galatians and Paul, in Galatians, Paul says, well, you know, you just need to believe. And in James, James says, no, 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 you need to do something about it. And they really don't conflict with each other. They're just talking about opposite sides of the same coin. But we're going to get there. Uh, we're going to look at John's little letters about sin and forgiveness and how it is that God works inside of us to clean us up from the inside out. We're going to look at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John about loving each other. We're going to look at 1st Peter about suffering. Oh, that looks that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Oh, how fun. Yeah, you know, I thought we, we did Job in the Old Testament, didn't we? Then we don't have to do suffering again, do we? Well, yeah, we do, because not everybody read Job. We're going to look at 2 Peter and Jude that are so very similar to each other as they talk about unfaithful leaders. And that would be not only in the church, but in our community. Because the sorts of people that we look for for leaders in our church are the same kind of leaders we want in our community. Yep. Honest, kind, get along with people, not quarrelsome, not drunkards, you know, just some basic things like that. So 2 Peter and Jude both talk about unfaithful leaders. And then once we've got all that down, then we're going to look at Revelation and how Revelation talks about past, present, and future. The past, the long past, all the way to creation. The present, which is when Revelation was being written there at the end of the first century. And then the future, which would include now for them because it's the future for the writers of Revelation, and, and we're in the future as far as they're concerned, but Revelation looks ahead to the future beyond where we are as well. So we're going to look at past, present, and future, and I hope that af as, after that's over that Revelation will make a little bit more sense to you. I hope. I, that's the plan. <laughs> Any questions so far? Observations? Fears? Concerns? Worried we might skip something. This is why I hope that you'll write down your questions as you read your stuff. That we may or may not be going to cover whatever it is that you want to know about 
specifically, but if you ask, we will. Okay? Okay. okay. Well, the New Testament is here to show us Jesus. Jesus is here to show us the Father. And having read the Old Testament will enrich the New Testament for you. Because all the writers of the New Testament assume that you already have a working knowledge of the Old Testament. So when they quote scriptures, for instance, they don't quote the whole long thing. They'll just quote a little bit. And they trust that you know it well enough, you can fill in the blanks. Okay, if I say the Lord is my shepherd, I hope that you know the rest of the way that that psalm goes. So that becomes shorthand to tap into something that you already know. And the New Testament writers often did that. So part of what's going to happen as you read this is you're going to, I hope, because you've read the Old Testament, that you're going to have these echoes of, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh, he's talking about, oh, he's talking about that. Oh, that fits together. Because that's really the way that God means for it to happen. Now, you, you were talking about a radio preacher that was, talking to a Jewish person and said, you know, I want to talk about God. And the Jewish person said, yeah, but you can't use the New Testament. <laughs> That's really okay. Because all the writers of the New Testament didn't have the New Testament yet. The only Bible they had was the Old Testament. So if they're going to talk about Jesus, they're going to talk about Jesus from the Old Testament. They're in the process of writing the New Testament, even as they're doing it. So. The New Testament writers assume that, and I hope that this is going to, that the New Testament is going to fulfill what you read in the Old Testament, just as the Old Testament pointed ahead, and by the end of it, I hope you were just dying to meet Jesus. <laughs> but the New Testament is going to enrich, the Old Testament is going to enrich your experience of the New Testament, and they both fit together. So at the end of this, you're going to go, oh, this is great. Let's do this again. Okay. Any questions? Or in, in the New Testament, you know, it either refers to Jesus explained the scriptures. Yes. And even to the disciples, or eventually the disciples explained the scriptures, like to the uh, eunuch, you know, they stopped and he just jumped up in the carriage and started explaining the scriptures. That right. Mm-hmm. Explaining where he was. Yes. And sadly, sometimes it says Jesus opened their scriptures to them. It's like, yeah, but he doesn't write it down. I'm like, dang it, he didn't. Luke didn't tell us what Jesus said. Uh, I wish. But that's what we're going to try to do. Well, let's pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.